Good afternoon. Thank you all for finding time and uh, receiving today's webinar. My name is Tanya Jirasatit Thon Pong. I am Senior Program Officer of AIT, AIT Extension, Asian Institute of Technology. AIT Extension is Continuing Education Center and Professional Development Center. Today, our topic today is IFRS 9, IFRS 15, IFRS 16, uh, by Mr. Ahari, partner of public accountant firm and uh, accounting lecturer from Indonesia. Before we start, let me explain how you can talk to us during the webinar. If you have any question during the presentation, just write them down in the question and answer box. At the end of uh, the presentation, we will answer all of your questions. And the next program will be the opening message from Mr. Fasler Karim, the Director Program of AIT Extension. And I'd like, like to pass the stage to Mr. Fasler Karim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. It is my pleasure to warmly welcome all of you to this webinar. I am Fasler Karim, Director Program at AIT Extension. Thank you all for making the time to attend this seminar. And I note that over 180 attendees have registered for this event. Today, we will be having a session on preparing for International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS 9, IFRS 15 and 16. The speaker, Mr. Alec, will focus on IFRS 9, IFRS 15 and IFRS 16. Mr. Alec is an external resource person for AI Extension and has been training our international participants on IFRS for the last couple of years. In this virtual conference room, I recognize some familiar names of participants engaged in the accounting and financial sector. I am sure we are also reaching out many new participants who are practicing practitioners representing the civil society. Mr. Ali will speak for about 40 minutes. Thereafter, we will have Q&A session at the end of his presentation. If you have any question during or after the presentation, just write them to the Q&A box. All these questions will be compiled by the moderator and the speaker will address them at the end. I will now pass on to my colleague, Ms. Tania, who will moderate this session. Thank you very much, Mr. Karim. And uh, I will invite uh, Mr. Ahali from Indonesia to start your presentation. And once again, the question and answer will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, Ms. Tania. Hello, Mr. Karim. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity for conduct uh, as a trainer in this webinar. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, I will say hello to my colleague, uh, my friend uh, from Bangladesh, from Indonesia, from Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, and from Malaysia. Okay, welcome to Asian Institute of Technology. Yeah, for this session, yeah, we will uh, conduct the seminar uh, webinar about IFRS 9, IFRS 15, and IFRS 16. Yeah, okay, let me introduce myself first. Uh, I'm uh, my name is Ahalik. I'm from Indonesia, and I'm uh, one of the external source of uh, Asian Institute of Technology. Let me share my screen first. Actually, this is my photo. Yeah, when I was in AIT, right? Yeah, this is on March 2020, about four months ago, right? I remember when I went to. Thailand, right, on March 1st. And then in the 2nd March, there is a there was an announcement from our president, President Joko Widodo, that two people in Indonesia, yeah, exactly, the two ladies, yeah, from Indonesia is infected coronavirus. Yeah, and I remember when I come back, yeah, from Thailand, yeah, from Bangkok to Jakarta, yeah, lucky me that there is no travel ban, yeah, because it is still... Uh, March 7, yeah, maybe about yeah uh, a few weeks later after that, yeah, there is a travel ban, yeah, come and from to Indonesia. All right, yeah, this is like yeah my little introduction, yeah. That's the relation between me and then uh, the AIT. I, I'm so miss uh, Thailand. I'm so missing the AIT, yeah, with the green environment and then the cozy place to study, yeah, and so on and so on. All right, okay. Uh, I will start uh, with the IFRS 9. Yeah, that is a financial financial instrument. Yeah, so there are actually there are three uh, big standard. Yeah, IFRS 9. Uh, that is about a financial instrument. IFRS 15 about revenue from contract with the customer and then IFRS
RS 16 about the links. Actually, this is the big, big standard, yeah, in the accounting world, yeah, especially, yeah, uh, like in ASEAN country, right, yeah, that must be implement IFRS, yeah, because uh, actually previously, yeah, previously, yeah, our accounting standard refers to US GAAP or American standard. Now our standard, yeah, refers to European. Okay, so that's why it is not easy, yeah, to adopt something new, right? Okay, so the IFRS 9 itself, yeah, it is valid effectively in 2018. Yeah, IFRS 15 in 2018 also and uh, IFRS 16 in 2019, yeah. But in every country, the date for the effectively valid is different. For example, like in Indonesia, right, yeah, uh, the IFRS 9, IFRS uh, 15, and IFRS uh, 16, that was effectively valid on January 1st, 2020, yeah. So that's why this is the big standard, yeah. Yeah, additionally, there is, a, there was a COVID-19, right, the pandemic COVID-19, yeah. So that's why, yeah, this standard is valid at the time the pandemic uh, the COVID-19 yeah in the pandemic all right so let's we start with the financial instrument right okay financial instrument actually what is financial instrument yeah what is financial instrument we often hear about financial instrument okay based on the standard based on the theoretical yeah in the IFRS 9 a financial instrument is any contract that give rise to blah 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 right a financial instrument is a any contract yeah that give rise to Okay, take a look at this. The financial asset of one entity. Okay, this is the, let's say, assume that this is a one entity, right? Yeah, financial asset of one entity and financial liability or equity instrument of another entity. All right, take a look. Yeah, look, there are two parties here. Yeah, two parties. Yeah, they make a contract. Yeah, at the time, one party recognize it as a financial asset. Yeah, so there will be another party, the contra party, the opposite party, yeah, will recognize it as a financial liability or equity instrument, all right? For example, for example, yeah, this is the category in financial instrument, yeah? Let's say when you have, oh yeah, the category of financial instrument in the primary instrument. Yeah, actually, we have primary instrument, yeah? Uh, as we can uh, see that every company has a financial instrument from the simple things to the, the complex thing. Yeah, but I'm sure that every company yeah has financial instrument. All right, the first financial instrument yeah the category is a primary instrument. All right, okay. Let's take a look the example. For example, when you have cash on bank, when you have cash on bank, all right, okay. When you have cash on bank, so there will be another party. Yeah, okay. Exactly the bank, right? Yeah, the bank will recognize it as a payable yeah to bank customer. All right. When you have a cash on bank, yeah, so there will be another party, yeah, that is a bank, will recognize it as a payable to the customer, payable to the bank customer. So look, there is a two party here, yeah. Okay, the second one is a receivable. When you have receivable, yeah, so there will be another party, yeah, recognize it as a payable, right? Okay, so that uh, once again, this is the contra party. There are two party involved yeah, in this case, yeah, when you have receivable, there will be another party will recognize it as a, as a payable, right? The next is uh, investment in bonds. Yeah, when you have investment in bonds, yeah, so there will be another party will recognize it as a bonds payable, right? So the issuer of the bonds, yeah, the issuer of the bond will recognize it as a bonds payable, okay? And then the last one, when you have investment in stock, all right, so there will be another party will recognize it as a capital stock, right? Okay, so this is the example of the primary instrument that I'm sure that every company has financial instrument from the, the very simple financial instrument to the complex financial instrument. Yeah, let's say we have a cash on bank. At least we have cash on bank, right? Or at least we have a receivable. Yeah, because we make the uh, selling transaction, yeah? Every company is selling something, right? Okay, so there will be a receivable on that. So the receivable is a financial instrument. Yeah, cash on back is a financial instrument. Yeah, so that's why yeah, the financial instrument yeah will guide you about how to how's the accounting treatment yeah related to the financial instrument, right? Okay, next the secondary yeah. So there is a primary 
and also there is a secondary financial instrument yeah there is a secondary financial instrument okay the secondary financial instrument we can call as a same yeah there are two party involved yeah the secondary financial instrument we call as a derivative yeah so same yeah when one party recognize as a derivative receivable there will be another party will recognize it as a derivative payable all right okay one is a derivative receivable and then another will recognize it as a derivative payable all right okay so what is derivative yeah derivative as a secondary financial instrument yeah what are they yeah okay what is it take a look what is derivative actually the derivative yeah derivative is uh, okay before we go to the definition of the derivative look at this item okay look at this item yeah this is uh, oil right the oil the gold the corn copper right okay and then also the foreign currency like a us dollar but thailand yeah indonesian rupiah euro and so on and so on yeah and also this is the share price all right this is the share price and also there is a interest rate and the indices or index right Okay, what are the characteristic? Yeah, what is the what are the characteristic? What is the similar? Uh, what is the similar things about them? Yes, yeah, the similar thing about them they are fluctuat fluctuative, right? Yeah, they are fluctuative. Yeah, like the oil price, the oil price is uh, up and down. Yeah, and also the foreign currency also up and up and down. Yeah, the share price. Is up and down, yeah. Interest rate, yeah, like a uh, LIBOR, London Interbank Overrate, yeah, Singapore Interbank Overrate, yeah, and so on and so on. The interest rate also, yeah, up and down, yeah. And then the indices, the index, yeah, the index, yeah, is also fluctuative, fluctuative, yeah, up and down. All right, okay. So because, yeah, the under because uh, the some things here, yeah, these things are fluctuative right okay because it is fluctuative so that's why yeah uh, for example when you have payable or receivable yeah when you have payable or receivable yeah in okay let's say uh when your company made export and import transaction yeah let's say your company made the export and import transaction so that's why you will need a foreign currency to settle your liabilities yeah when you have to settle your liabilities in foreign currency yeah you need yeah more currency you need to buy the foreign currency yeah because the foreign currency is up and down yeah so you need uh your company facing the risk all right okay the risk from the uh increasing of the foreign currency yeah so your company facing a loss risk yeah because there is a possibility the foreign currency will go up yeah and then uh, your company will get loss yeah so that's why your company facing a risk yeah not only on the foreign currency for example yeah you need a direct material you need a direct material yeah let's say your direct material is uh, oil yeah as we have known that uh, the oil price also up and up and down yeah so your company also facing a facing a risk yeah because of the uh, fluctuation the fluctuation of the uh, all of this thing yeah so we call yeah all of this as a as a uh, underlying underlying item all right okay next so this is the this is the definition right the definition of the derivative it's a contract yeah same yeah with the financial instrument in general term the contract between two or more party and the derivative derive its price from fluctuation in the underlying uh, underlying item or underlying asset so we call as a, like a oil price yeah the foreign currency rate and then the share price the interest rate and then the indices as uh, underlying yeah so it uh, the value yeah the value of the uh, the derivative yeah it depends on the underlying yeah the gain or loss that you will get yeah that depends on the underlying item along that okay next so what is the purpose of the derivative yeah what is the purpose of derivative okay the first purpose of the spec uh, derivative is for the speculative yeah this is like 
uh, same like when you are uh, taking a bath, yeah, when you are taking a bath in, when you are taking a bath in a soccer game, yeah. So the soccer game, there is a uncertain, uncertain soccer uh, score, yeah. Okay, so we can we can assume that the score the score in the uh, soccer yeah yeah as the underlying because it is uncertain so it become the object of the speculative so you taking a bet yeah you taking a bet yeah uh, for speculation all right okay so this is like taking a bet right okay so the purpose of the derivative the first one is for yeah for the speculation for the speculation so you take the opportunity you take the advantage yeah from the yeah, up and down of the underlying item. The second purpose of the derivative is uh, hedging. Oh, yeah, that's a hedging. For example, yeah, as uh, we have discussed before, when you have payable, yeah, or receivable in the foreign currency, right? So you are facing a race. Yeah, let's say you have a uh, payable in the foreign currency, you have a race, yeah, to get lost, yeah, in the future because of the foreign currency, let's say, is going up. Yeah. So to minimize the risk, yeah. So you conduct the hedging, the hedging transaction. All right. Okay. So that is the derivative. So in the next, yeah. So in detail, yeah. So there will be a topic about the how to measure the effectiveness of the hedging, yeah. Whether your company conduct the hedging, yeah, it is effective or not. So there will be a calculation for that. All right. Next, yeah. So the derivative itself, yeah, of course, it will, uh, there will be, they will create a gain or, it will create the gain or loss. All right. Okay. When you are taking a bet, so there are two opportunities. There are two opportunities. Yeah. Uh, you got gain or you lost. Yeah. Same like hedging too. Yeah. Okay. There are two, uh, there are two opportunity. Yeah. Get a gain or a loss. Yeah. Because this is something like a taking a bet. All right. Yeah. Like you play in the casino, right? Yeah. So there are two opportunity. Get gain or get lost. All right. Next. Next is a uh, classification of the financial instrument. Yeah. Okay. Let's say that the AIT corporation bought investment. Both bond investment, yeah, that issued by MBK Corporation. Let's say this investment should be classified as follow, yeah, based on the business model and cash flow characteristic, yeah. Let's say when you have a bonds, yeah, when you have a bonds investment, yeah. So there will be a classification on that, yeah. The first classification, let's say the intention, yeah, of buying the bonds is not for sale, yeah. You have a bond, you buy a bond, and then you will not sell it, yeah. You will hold these bonds until it is mature. Yeah. Same like when you buy a car and then you will use the car for your daily activity. Yeah. So you will help this car. Yeah. You will hold this car until it is, until the useful life is ended. All right. Okay. So this is not for sale bond because you will help it until it is mature. All right. Okay. So we call it as a amortized cost. Yeah. Same like when you buy a car and then you will use it. So of course you will depreciate it. All right. Because the value of the car yeah, will not be same yeah, as the first time you bought it. All right. Okay. So it is amortized. It is amortized cost. The second one, yeah, you buy a bond, yeah, the investment in bonds that your intention in the future, you will sell it. Yeah while you will hold it and then you enjoy with the with the interest right yeah because the bond will you will give you an interest right you will hold it but there is the intention you will sell it one day yeah to fulfill your liquidity for example when you need money when you need a fresh cash right yeah you will sell your you will sell your investment in bond so we call it as a fair value through other comprehensive income so this category of the bonds is a FET OCI or fair value through other comprehensive it. and then the last one yeah is uh yeah it is uh when you buy a bond yeah the intention is you will sell it yeah immediately let's say you buy today and then you will sell it tomorrow yeah or or even you buy in the morning and then you will sell it in the evening all right yeah so this kind of bonds we call it as a we will categorize as a fair value through profit and loss yeah because you expect yeah you expect that you will get gain yeah immediately yeah through selling of this bond all right okay so this is the classification of financial is instrument based on business model and cash flow characteristics. How about if you have investment in stock? Yeah. So that uh, as we have known that a stock, there is no mature maturity date, right? For the stock. So the stock will be classified as a FET OCI or as a 
FTPL ya yeah? because uh, there is no classification amortized cost for investment in stock so there are only two category for investment in stock all right okay next okay this is the summary of the uh, financial instrument category in the financial instrument okay there are category is it amortized compared to fair value and then how about if there is a gain or loss from the comparing to the fair value okay take a look for example like amortized cost yeah pretending that you buy a car yeah and then you will use your car for your daily activity will you depreciate it your car yes yeah so it will be amortized yeah will you compare your car value to the to the fair value no you don't care about the fair value because you will use your car until it is mature until the end of the useful life yeah so it will be not applicable right again how's the treatment from the gain or loss it will be not applicable because you don't compare uh the book value of the car with the fair value you don't care about that FET OCI will you amortize yes yeah because while you're using it yeah so you will you can sell it yeah compared to fair value of course yes yeah when there is a different between fair value and then the book value you will recognize the gain or loss to the other comprehensive income all right and then the third one is uh, FETPL yeah this is like the intention you will you will buy sell and buy and sell right okay yeah will you amortize it no yeah like like pretending you buy a car yeah but the intention of buying the car if you want you want to sell it immediately yeah so like you are uh, as a uh, entrepreneur in the uh, car showroom right you buy a car that the intention of you buy a car you, you want to sell it again okay so it will be uh, it will not be amortized right compared to the fair value of course yes right and then the the gain or loss from comparing to the fair value goes to the profit and profit and loss yeah okay next now we go to IFRS oh yeah another things in the IFRS 9 yeah it's about expected credit loss or allowance for impairment loss yeah in IFRS 9 for receivable yeah when you have receivable all right when you have receivable let's say yeah okay in the IFRS 9, you will categorize your receivable into three categories. Yeah. Okay. You will categorize your receivable into three categories. Yeah. The the first category is a stage one. Yeah. Or the stage one or level one. Yeah. Look the emoticon of this. Yeah. The emoticon is yeah. Uh, uh, you are happy, right? Okay. You are happy, and then uh, this is because your receivable is performing. Yeah. Because your receivable is performing means that yeah there is no issue that the receivable will not be collected right yeah your debtor is paying on time yeah paying the principal paying the interest yeah yeah by the on time basis yeah so uh you are not worried about your debtor uh, so that's why the stage one is uh, performing yeah so even though it is performing so you have to uh you have to create yeah the allowance for impairment losses right because something like you make allowance for something that your receivable will not be collected in the future right because when you have receivable there is a risk on that right uh, there is a risk stick on your receivable that your receivable will not be collected yeah in the future so that's why you have to make uh, allowance right okay so the approach in an allowance is uh, using 12 month approach okay the second one is a stage two the stage two look the emoticon so you you uh you you start to be worried right yeah because your receivable is credit risk is significantly increased let's say your debtor is is late yeah uh pay you late all right okay it must be you have to uh, you uh, you must receive it you must collect it on january 30 let's say but your debtor pay it on march right yeah so you are starting to be worried about it yeah so it will be in stage two so that's why logically when the stage one is must be uh, you have to create impairment losses low one for impairment losses yeah okay so the stage two yeah you need more impairment losses on that yeah you need more loan yeah furthermore the stage three is okay look yeah it is started to be yeah you scream you stress right because your receivable uh the due date sorry the the aging of the receivable more than 90 days it is late more than 90 days let's say so you are still screaming about it yeah so this is we call as an impairment yeah so the impairment itself so you have to create also the allowance for impairment loss so from the stage one to stage two and stage three every stage you have to create the allowance because there is a possibility that your receivable will not be collected all right next we goes to ifrs 15 there's a revenue from contract with customer okay actually there are five step model for revenue recognition there are five step model for revenue recognition the step one is okay identify the contract with 
with the customer. Okay, so this is uh, actually this uh, topic, this uh, standard, yeah, uh, focus on how you recognize the revenue, yeah, when you recognize the revenue, yeah, and then how much you recognize the revenue. Okay, the step one is identify the contract with your customer. Yeah, every contract has a different uh, like uh, right and obligation. The step two is identify the performance obligation in the contract. Yeah, what is your obligation on that? What is your obligation in the contract? Yeah, and then also in every obligation, of course, there is a there is a transaction price. How much the price? Yeah, uh, related to the obligation that you have to fulfill. Yeah, and then step four is you allocate. Yeah, the uh, transaction price to the uh, to the PO. Yeah, or performance obligation. And then the last one is you recognize the revenue. Okay. Okay. So actually, in IFRS 15, there are two methods to recognize the revenue. Yeah. There are two methods to recognize the revenue. The first one is recognizing revenue by overtime. Yeah. Look, this is like a ruler. Yeah. Okay. You recognize revenue over time during a period. The second one, you will recognize yeah the revenue at the point in time. Yeah. Only on the certain day. Yeah. You recognize the the revenue. Okay. Look. Okay. Okay, this is uh, the criteria to recognize revenue by overtime. Yeah. Okay. Look uh, the example. I will give you the example. Yeah. The airline case in 2018. Yeah. I will not mention the name of the airlines. Yeah. This is happened in the Asian country. Yeah. Airline case in 2018. Yeah. Let's say. Yeah. Step one. Step one is identify contract with customer, right? Okay. For example, Koala Airlines. Yeah. Let's say made a contract with AGH company on October 1st, 2018. Yeah. Koala Airlines made a contract with AGH company on October 2018. So this is the step one. Identify the contract with your customer. Okay. The contract, let's say, related to the installation of Wi-Fi in plane for Koala Airlines. Yeah. Let's say, yeah, uh, like in the uh, like in the uh, the the airlines, yeah. To go abroad, right? Yeah. So there is a Wi-Fi in the airline. So this contract between Koala and the AGH related to the installation of Wi-Fi in the plane uh, for the Koala Airlines. Yeah. Okay. L now take a look at step step two. The step two identify the PO or performance obligation in the contract. Yeah. Let's say the AGH company has a right to install the Wi-Fi supporting system in the plane, and then the Koala Airlines has obligation to give a right to AGH company. Yeah. Step three, determine the transaction price. Let's say the Koala Airlines will receive contract fee within 15 years for 2,239,940,000. Yeah. Okay. 239 million. 940,000. Yeah, this is the contract for the 15 for the 15 year. Okay. Look step 4. Step 4 is allocate transaction price to the performance obligation in the contract. All right? Because the contract is for the 15 year, so the fee per year contract should be 239,940 something, yeah, over 15 year. So the every year, yeah, the Koala Airlines can recognize revenue 15 million 966,000. All right. Okay. It should recognize per year 15 million something. All right. Okay. And then because look, yeah, step four, step five is a recognize revenue when or as the entity satisfies a performance obligation. Okay. So the revenue should be recognized in the Koala Airlines in 2018 is only two months, right? Okay. Because the contract is starting on 31st October or November 1st. November to this. December, yeah. So the revenue recognized only two months. Okay. So two over 12 times 15 million something. Yeah. So the recognition of revenue in 2018 should be 2 million 600 something, right? While the Koala Airlines journal journalized yeah, as follow. Look, okay. AR or account receivable to revenue 239. So this is the big mistake, right? This is the big mistake, yeah? Because you recognize revenue, yeah? Very, very overstated, all right? It should be 2 million something, but you recognize 239, yeah? So your revenue, yeah, or your profit is overstated in 2018, yeah? So as we have now that in this case, yeah, the the airlines get a penalty from the government and all of the uh, director all of the committee that signs in the financial statement yeah get fined yeah get penalty from the government and also the public accountant firm that uh, make the audit yeah to this company yeah get a penalty also right okay so this is uh 
IFRS, IFRS uh, 15. All right. So this is totally wrong. You are so, this is so uh, uh, the big mistake, right? Yeah. Conducted by this company. Okay. How is the revenue recognition in the real estate? Yeah. Okay. For example, in the real estate company, yeah, the revenue recognition in the real estate company, mostly at the time of headed over, like in the Koala Airlines here, yeah, in the Koala Airlines here, the Koala Airlines should recognize over time, right? Not at the point in time. Yeah, as we have uh, discussed before, yeah, as we have discussed before, yeah, there are two methods to recognize the revenue, yeah, at the point in time and the over time. Okay, so the Koala Airlines in this case should recognize revenue over time, yeah, not at the point in time. The big mistake of this Koala Airlines, yeah, they recognize revenue at the point in time, yeah, they recognize revenue 239 million something, yeah, so the 239 million something, it should be recognized over 15 years, right, not at the point in time yeah so this is the big mistake yeah for the koala airline okay so what is the impact to the another uh, what is the impact of the ifrs 15 yeah to the another industry let's say in the real estate industry yeah how is the revenue recognition in the real estate industry right okay so the impact is previously the real estate industry can recognize revenue by overtime based on the progress right yeah let's say your progress is 30 percent so you can recognize revenue 30 when your progress is 40%, you can recognize uh, revenue 40 But nowadays, it's not. Because, yeah, the recognition revenue in the uh, in the IFRS 15, this depends on the controlling, yeah. The controlling itself, yeah, is uh, having by the customer when the real estate or when the apartment is handed over by the developer, all right? So the answer is mostly at the time of handed over. Because this time, the customer will get a control yeah upon the house or the apartment okay so that's why the so there's a big impact yeah to the real estate industry yeah previously they can recognize revenue by progress or uh over the time right but nowadays yeah they will recognize a revenue at the time of the handed over yeah uh in the next few years all right next the last one is a list yeah i've had a 16 yeah i'm 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 sure that every company has lease transition or a rent transit, all right? Okay, what is lease? What is lease? Yeah, lease, uh, lease, uh, lease is, yeah, look, the right to control the use of asset, right? Yeah, there are two parties involved here, the lessor and the lessee. Yeah, when you rent, uh, from another party, so you are lessee. Yeah, when you are, yeah, uh, the owners, yeah, of the property, you are the lesser. Yeah, so the right to control the use. So the lesser give a right to control of the lease asset to lessee. Yeah, and then lessee will give yeah consideration yeah will lease will give a payment will pay the lesser yeah because the lease yeah has a right to control that asset belongs to a uh, lesser all right actually there are type of lease yeah there are two type of lease yeah there is operating lease and then the second one okay second one letter okay the operating lease the operating is a very very simple transaction very simple treatment yeah for example in the lease side journal in lease right the the lease will recognize the rent expense to cash right at the time you pay the uh, at the time you pay the rent yeah so you will recognize rent expense to cash all right and then the lesser yeah lesser will receive cash so the lesser will recognize cash to rent revenue all right okay so this is very simple yeah very simple in the uh, operating list yeah okay and then next how about the financial list? yeah financial list is a uh, very complex there's a complex accounting treatment yeah okay when you when you have a, a list transaction so the first First journal that you have to make is the right use of asset. Yeah, so you recognize revenue in this case. Yeah, Re asset. Uh, sorry, you recognize asset in this case. Yeah, so this is asset to liability. Yeah, this is like uh, the contract is lease or rent, but the treatment is like you buy something by installment. Yeah, because you recognize asset and then you recognize the liability. All right, and then at the time you pay, yeah, the journal will be liabilities and there is an interest expense and then also the cash. So at every time you pay it, it consists 
basis of interest and then the principal. Yeah, and also you will depreciate the asset. Depreciation expense to accumulated depreciation. Yeah, and then in the lesser journal in lesser. Yeah, okay, the lesser will yeah in contra like like a mirroring. Yeah, so the lesser will recognize receivable and also yeah pretending that the lesser will give you the asset. So in the credit side, it's a lease lease asset. All right, and then at the time the lesser receive cash yeah from you as a lessee, you uh the lesser will recognize cash right yeah interest revenue and then the lease receivable all right now ifrs 16 introduced a single lease accounting model and required a lessee to recognize asset and liability for all lessees with a term or more than 12 months unless the underlying asset is a low value a lessee is required to recognize a right use of asset representing its right to use the underlying lease asset and the lease liability representing its obligation to make a lease payment yeah actually yeah on, uh, in default every lease transaction is a financial lease all right except when you lease term is less than one year and then the underlying asset of the low value yeah is a low value when it is new all right so once again actually every lease transaction yeah for the lazy side is a financial lease except if it is yeah less than one year and then the the asset that you lease is a low value all right so the low value asset is less than five thousand for example like what for example like the simple furniture yeah in the office and then the notebook or laptop right yeah or the mobile phone this is the low value low value asset yeah if you rent it less than 12 months so you will recognize it as a operating lease yeah but more than 5000 yeah okay uh whatever you lease more or less than 12 months yeah if it is high value asset it will be recognized as a financial lease so the consequence if you recognize it as a financial lease so you have to recognize the asset liability interest expense and then also the depreciation all right so uh the different treatment will have the impact all right the different treatment operating lease or financial list will have a different impact to your financial statement. Of course, will have the impact to the uh, financial analysis. Yeah. So, so you, we have, we are as an analyst, we have to be careful. Look at the financial statement, whether the company using operating or financial list. So it will be give the impact. Yeah. To the ratio. Yeah. Of uh, performance ratio. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's all my presentation. And then uh, the next session will be as a question and answer. Cop Crap. Thank you very much, Pak Anhalik. And uh, we have a uh, question from Mr. Rudy Halim. And uh, he asks, what about revenue recognition IFRS 15 for landed house? This is the same with apartment IRS building at point of time or over the time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rudy Halim. All right. Okay. Actually, between the landed house and then the, the high-rise building, right? Okay. So, as the IFRS 15, right? Revenue from contract with the customer. Okay. I will show the screen. I will show the screen uh, again. All right. Okay. This is how you recognize revenue previously, actually. Yeah. Uh, previously, actually, uh, for the developer. Yeah. For the developer. Previously, yeah, using the old standard, the developer can recognize revenue. Yeah. Uh, based on the percentage of completion. When some requirement are met. For example, when uh, you have received at least 20% yeah of the down payment yeah at least you have received 20% and then the the foundation yeah the foundation the structure of the foundation of the building already finished so you can recognize revenue based on the percentage of completion but nowadays it must follow the rule it must follow the principle in the IFRS 15 all right okay so uh you can recognize revenue when customer simultaneously receive consume as the entity perform in the in the high rise building or in the landed house yeah okay you will you will uh you will consume yeah you will receive or consume yeah when it is handed over yeah when not at the time yeah uh during the progress so uh the first requirement is not fulfilled the second one entity create or enhance an asset and customer control it during the process indeed yeah in the developer they built yeah they built a building yeah a house or apartment yeah there is a work in progress but not in the control of the uh, your customer okay so the second the second requirement is not is not fulfilled number 3 created asset has no alternative use to the entity and the entity has the enforceable right to the payment for performing up to the date yeah if your contract is very strong yeah then you are sure that you will not
not have alternative use for the apartment that you build or the landed house that you build if you don't have any alternative use as a developer and then you can force yeah the customer to pay it so you can recognize revenue based on the percentage of completion but nowadays in the practice yeah in the practice yeah you still have alternative use for example yeah even though the customer already choose the unit that uh the unit yeah for example i choose unit number one yeah okay so the developer can change it yeah can a developer can hand it over to the another customer all right so so uh it is based on the contract i can uh, uh i don't say it is uh you cannot recognize revenue based on the percentage of completion but that is depends on the contract if you if you are as a developer and then you are sure yeah that your contract is very strong yeah to not uh have the alternative use for your uh, progress or uh, apartment or landed house and then you can force the customer to pay uh the to pay yeah so you can recognize revenue as a percentage of completion but if it is not yeah so you have to recognize revenue at the point in time at the time you hand it over the apartment or landed house to your customer thank you mr rudy Halim. that's my answer uh, Halim, uh, there is another question by uh Nasrul Buda. yes ifrs are implemented by all of organizations what are uh, reason behind that? Oh, all right. Okay. IFRS is become the global standard. Yeah. IFRS becoming the global standard. Like if we have known that, uh, like a G20 countries, right? Yeah. It is consists more than 20 countries actually. Yeah. The 20 countries itself. Yeah. The 20 countries itself is already commit to adopt IFRS because uh, G20 countries here uh, mm. contribute to the economic world about 75 until 85 percent. Yeah. So can you imagine? Yeah, the can the superpower country like the US, like a Japan, like a China, yeah, like a UK, Germany, Korea, Japan, right? They they commit to adopt IFRS, yeah. They commit to adopt IFRS. So the big country in the world adopt IFRS, yeah. So it be, uh, so it will enforce the another country to adopt IFRS, yeah. Because yeah, uh, you are not living alone, right? Yeah, in this world, yeah. Some country has, uh, for example, like a branch, yeah, or the subsidiary in the another country or your company is listed in the another company uh, in the stock exchange in the another company right that the mostly the superpower countries in this world yeah adopt IFRS so that's why yeah we don't have any choices yeah like uh in the ASEAN group right the ASEAN is a developing country so we have we don't have any choice yeah to adopt IFRS also to make the harmonization between one country to the another country between one company in this country to the another company in another uh, country will have the harmonization in a accounting standard that previously our accounting standard yeah mostly uh, refers to the US standard but nowadays it's a IFRS so that's why uh, not only as a commitment of the G20 country the IFRS itself has uh, the the higher quality the better quality rather than the US gap for example the better quality in the fair value measurement when you use the fair value measurement so it make your financial statement will be more relevant yeah okay rather than you use the historical cost because historical cost is the is the past right yeah okay that's the historical yeah we need current situation that's the one of the characteristic of the IFRS is using fair value so we can realize that uh IFRS has a better quality than the previous standard yeah okay one is the about the fair value the second one about the principle base right okay so it will need the professional judgment it will it is not rigid the the IFRS the standard itself is not rigid yeah like the US gap the US gap is so rigid yeah like a one plus one equals to two so this is rigid right yeah okay thank you thank you very much and uh, i would like to let you know that uh, if anyone of you would like to ask questions please raise your hand and then we will let you ask one by one thank you if you have any questions any other okay so no question uh, okay one one moment please uh there is a question from jennifer how is the calculation of the cost of impairment for a cost receivable all right. Calculation of the cost of impairment for a cost receivable. All right. Okay. The calculation for the receivable. Okay. So actually, yeah. Uh, the calculation for the impairment for the receivable we call as the expected credit loss model. So you can use the historical data. From the historical data, you have a uh, uh, a data about yeah how much uh, how many percentage yeah of your similar debtor has the probability of default. Default means is 
is the uh, default mean that your receivable yeah cannot be collected yeah let's say because your debtor is uh, bankrupt yeah have facing the financial difficulty and so on and so on yeah so that's why yeah the to calculate the expected credit loss or impairment based on the historical data you have a percentage yeah for the similar group of debtor you have the experience right yeah from the last five year for example yeah for example the group a yeah the group a of debtor you have the experience that the that the probability of default let's say five percent all right and then plus yeah uh, uh plus not only from the historical data but also from the forward looking yeah so you need the another in the in the i part is 99 here yeah so uh you need another uh the another knowledge yeah not only the counting knowledge but also you need knowledge about the the microeconomic the macroeconomic you need about the statistical and so on and so on yeah to look the what is the forward looking yeah uh, upon your upon your uh data yeah because uh you estimate what will happen in the future related to your uh data yeah regarding the let's say regarding the uh the economic situation yeah so not only from the historical data the percentage from the historical data but also from from the forward looking okay thank you okay uh thank you very much Papa Hamid. Uh, there is one person mr reggie raised his hand and i will allow, i will allow him to ask you a question okay All right. mr. Reggie, please mr reggie would you like to ask question okay uh i knew your speaker please mr reggie if you would like to ask question otherwise i will pass to another two questions okay Papa Hamid, there are two more questions the first one is from mr bokari he asking when comparing ifrs and gaap what are some overall key differences we should be aware of okay so uh the difference between the ifr and the us gap are the the basis the basis right for example like the us gap yeah the basis for the us gap is a rule base yeah rule base is like one plus one equals to two that is a rule yeah but the ifrs is using the principle base like a one plus one it can be equals to 1.8 to 2.2 so as long as the result the condition yeah is a between 1.8 until 2.2 yeah so our for example for me yeah from the uh from the side of the company's condition one plus one equals to let's say uh 1.8 and then from the side of your company one plus one equals to 2.1 okay because our result is in the between all right so our decision is same yeah so we need the professional judgment yeah so uh something that we have to aware in the in the ifrs is uh using professional judgment there is a touch of the professional judgment so that's why yeah to make the professional judgment you need a uh, proper experience you need proper learning yeah and then uh training yeah and then education and so on and so on to make the proper professional professional judgment so the keyword to learn about the new ifrs standard is a principle base yeah okay so there will be no like one plus one equals to two all right okay so you need professional judgment because ifrs will only give you the criteria yeah the criteria let's say for example like uh one plus one equals to 1.8 until two point so be, uh, in the criteria uh in them yeah so you need the professional professional judgment thank you okay thank you thank you very much for a holic and our we will open for one last question if you have any question please raise your hand or type in the q and a box okay uh there is one more question this is holic from uh jennifer the part of procedures still apply for ifrs 15 because now focus on control all right okay yeah that's correct yeah the focus on the ifrs 15 now is uh, controlling all right okay previously in the previous standard yeah you can recognize revenue yeah when uh when the benefit and raise goes to the uh goes to the customer but now it's a controlling yeah so that's different right okay previously it's a risk yeah risk and the benefit goes to the customer but now it goes control for example like the real estate right like real estate industry the control is hold by the customer yeah uh when the real estate yeah the building or the apartment is handed over to the customer so that's why mostly for the real estate uh developer yeah they will recognize revenue at the time of the handed over because uh it will transfer the controlling from the real estate to the customer thank you very much thank you very much and uh, i hope that would be the last question
information. If you have any more questions, please send to us. We will address to you by help. And uh, right now, I would like to invite Mr. Karim to close the session. Thank you. It has been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you all for your patience and understanding. Please be reminded that the full recorded version of this webinar will be shared to all the participants through email. There were a few more questions which Mr. Ali could not address within our stipulated time. We will compile them and post it to the participants. We will continue our webinar series on different topics in the next few weeks. The announcement will be posted in our website. During this pandemic period, apart from the webinars, we are arranging online trainings on similar topics, which we will post it in our website. Please feel free to contact us if you are interested to attend any of those trainings. Especially, an online training on IFRS will be arranged in September. We invite all of you and other interested participants to join the online training. The next training series on IFRS will be as shown on the slide. IFRS 9, IFRS 15, IFRS 16 schedules. That means we will have three sessions. One will be on IFRS 9, the other one will be on IFRS 15, and the other, the last one will be on IFRS 16. So these three training program will be one hour, uh, will be one day's program. It will be three hours each. So those who are interested, please contact us and we will send you the details of all those training programs. My sincere thanks to Mr. Ali for his valuable presentation and sharing insights on the topic. I would like to extend my profound thanks to our technical staff and our colleagues at AIT Extension for their wholehearted support and cooperation. A special thanks to all the participants for their patience, understanding and engagement. We will sign off by wishing you a wonderful day today. Stay healthy and stay safe through this challenging time. Thank you.